Dear participants, welcome on this cosmetic webinar on the topic making it in USA, India, and United Arab Emirates. Uh, I introduce myself. I'm Segura Nurut. Sorry, I have to wear the, the mask so you cannot see my whole face. <laughs> I'm the International Partnership Manager at Cosmetic Valley and coordinator of the project, European project, which is called Global Cosmetic Cluster Europe. Um, before starting on the topic, I just want to give you a real technical brief so you understand how it works and it's more for question and answer since this webinar is a live conference so you'll be able to ask questions of course uh, between each presentation. So we have three parts. Each uh, part will last eight minutes and then we have seven minutes of question and answer for each part. So to do so, if you'd like to ask a question, you'll be able to go in the webinar menu, which is which appears on the top, top right of the screen. Click on the small orange arrow to display the control panel. And then click on the question chat to unroll it, write the question, and send it. So I'll be able to see it and to, uh, to present it to the speakers. Uh, you'll be able also to download some documents, the presentation of the speakers, also the presentation of the Global Cosmic Cluster Europe project, and the Cosmic Valley Agenda in 2020. Um, so don't hesitate to download them afterwards. <clears throat> so to start, let me introduce you the Global Cosmic Cluster Europe. Uh, which is a European project that gathers, it's a partnership between European cosmic clusters that aims to foster collaboration and support SMEs in their globalization, internationalization towards third markets. It's a two years project which is co funded by the COSMIC program of the European Union that starts this September. The idea, the ambition is to boost SMEs' competitiveness by helping SMEs to face international challenges, by sharing experience and organizing common actions. It's also to represent European cosmetic expertise by sharing common brandings to enhance the visibility of our SMEs expertise and in at, a, at an international scale. And the last is to foster business and innovation collaborative projects between our uh, SMEs. To achieve those ambitions, many actions uh, will be deployed within the project, so, such as market trends, market watch, uh, business missions, training, coaching, um, well, different events. We'll see if we'll be, be able to do it physically or not. We'll see that in the year. But um, those actions will be focused on five different uh, target markets, which are India, Mexico, South Korea, United. Arab Emirates and United States of America. And that's why this webinar you're going to assist today is focused on three of those countries. And I'm glad to welcome the uh, partners of the Global Alliance um, organization. And uh, so I'll present you the different speaker right after. <clears throat> so Jean-Pierre, is going to present you the Global Alliance organization, and then I'll present you the three speakers of it. Yes, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, let me introduce Global Alliance very quickly. It's an association. It's the first network in France uh, with international business experts. Uh, we are located quite everywhere in the world, as you can see in the in the map uh, afterwards. Yeah, the next slide. We have uh, 11 members um, and uh, we address uh, most of the strategic countries in, in the world. And then we have some affiliated members as well uh, to, to, to support us. Uh, so it's really a group of uh, international experts. And today you will have uh, three uh, of them uh, with the US, India and the Middle East. 
Uh, this is the type of uh, services that we give. So we start uh, really from the uh, beginning of the project going up to the end. And uh, of course, you will have this presentation that will be shared also at the end. So you will be able to see uh, all the different uh, uh, services that we offer, starting from a strategy, going into um, uh, partner search, distribution, supply chain, commercial developments, sourcing for some of the countries, HR, business setups, M&A. So you see that you have a, a lot of operational services that are offered to our clients. Thank you, Jean-Pierre. I didn't tell you, but uh, as it's uh, international webinars, uh, and it's in the framework of the Global Cosmic Cluster Europe, of course, participants are from France, from Turkey, from Portugal, from Spain, from Italy, and from Romania today. So yes. welcome for everyone. Yes, exactly, exactly. And most of our clients, by the way, are from different nationalities as well. Yeah, so <laughs> welcome to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. So Global Health is partner of, uh, of this uh, webinar. Thank you very much for being here and presenting those three countries. So we'll start with Sandy from Runeo Consulting that provides consulting services for companies wishing to expand their end behavior in North America through a customized program of market strategy, export assistance, and business development. So please, Sandy, present yourself. Yeah, hi, um, my name is Sandy Palamyapan. I'm a senior consultant at Vino Consulting in Houston, Texas. Um, I'm originally from Germany, but I have been living in the US since 2015, working with international companies and supporting them in their goal to expand into the US market. Thank you. After Sandy, we have Radhika, who is working for Expandis, uh, which support international companies to establish and grow in the UK, Australia, and India through their offices uh, in the network of Global Alliance also. Please, Radhika. Hi, so I'm Radhika Yelkur. I handle um, the India business entry part of uh, our business. I'm based in Bangalore in India in the South. And uh, as uh, most Global Alliance partners do, we handle everything from business entry strategy, market entry strategy, all the way up to uh, company formation and business development. Yeah. Thank you. And we'll end the presentation with Jean-Pierre, who already talked for Global Alliance, but please, Introduce yourself from TTO Golf, which is a uh, Dubai based consulting company uh, offering operational services to accelerate your commercial growth in the Middle East region. Exactly. So, uh, Jean Pierre Labré, uh, French, I have 25 years' experience in Dubai. Uh, and in fact, uh, we have a, a consulting company uh, mainly on operational. Uh, services. So our objective is really to uh, to go into your business, to understand your uh, challenges, and to find uh, solutions for you to accelerate your growth in the Middle East and North Africa uh, market as well. Thank you very much. Uh, just Jean Pierre and Sandy. This is Sophia from Cosmetic Valley. Sorry to interrupt this uh, uh, introduction, but uh, I can't um, uh, activate your cam. So I don't know, I, I've done it for Sandy, but for Jean-Pierre and Radhika, I can't do it. Um, so I don't know if you... Ah, perfect. Okay. And... <laughs> perfect. It okay. works. That, okay, great. So then I'll, I'll, I'll handle it. Perfect. <laughs> Hello, <Thank> everyone. <laughs> great. So now we'll pass on with uh, yeah. Sandy. So we can start with the first part, uh, and I remind you that you will be able to ask questions at the end of the, each part. Uh, so let's start with you, Sandy, um, on the U.S. market. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you also to Cosmetic Valley for hosting us today. Um, like I mentioned earlier, my name is Sandy Palanyapan. I'm a senior consultant at Vino Consulting, and I've been living in the U.S. since 2015. And we've been working with uh, many different types of companies, and we are helping them to expand their business into the U.S. market. 
um, on the next slide. Um, here's a short overview about my presentation today. First, a few general details about the US market, followed by a brief overview of the cosmetic industry in the US. Then a few words about how to enter the US market, as well as the first steps that a company should take. And lastly, two examples of cosmetic companies that we at Reno Consulting worked with in the past. So the next slide, who are we? So Reno Consulting was founded in 2002 and it's an international strategy and business development firm located in Houston, Texas. You can see Houston highlighted on the map on this slide. It's in the south of the US. Our clients include companies and organizations from Europe, Africa, Asia, so from all over the world. Uh, we provide business and trade consulting, conduct uh, market research, business partnership search, sales development, and many other services. Then on the next slide, um, the US market is one of the most popular markets for business expansions. And one of the main reasons for this is that the US is the world's largest economy. There are, however, however also challenges. So that's why it's ranked number eight in ease of doing business with. The total foreign, foreign direct investment was 1.7 trillion in the past 10 years. And it is one of the most developed and liquid financial markets in the world. Then now I will talk a little about the cosmetics industry in the US. The US cosmetics industry revenue in 2019 was estimated to be 49.5 billion US dollars. And the US consumer confidence has been very strong and rising per capita disposable income over the past five years have supported revenue growth. However, rising competition and the COVID-19 pandemic have um, lowered revenue and um, the cosmetic sector has been affected by the lockdowns like so many other industries and is now dealing with restrictions imposed after the lockdown. So for example, customers are unable to try out testers and physical stores, and limited numbers of people are allowed into the stores. So that's why many businesses have shifted their focus on online selling and promote their products mainly through social media platforms and tools like uh, virtual reality. So in the end, the sector is still thriving and the revenue is expected to grow by 0.4% uh, between 2019 and 2024. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So market competition. Um, there's a low level of market share concentration in the US cosmetics sector, which means that there are many small businesses and large companies such as EC Lauder, Procter & Gamble, and L'Oreal USA are very rare. Then, um, next slide. So what are important market trends and opportunities, especially for market, uh, for new market entrants? Next slide. Uh, first of all, trend number one is natural and environmentally friendly products. This means US consumers are becoming increasingly aware of ingredients, and um, manufacturing practices. So the consumer focus is on naturally made personal care items that are cruelty-free, uh, vegan, and sustainably sourced. Then next slide. Um, another important trend is the increased demand for anti-aging products. This trend comes from the fact that there's a larger consumer group of people aged 50 in the US and consumers start already in their early 30s and I would even say late 20s uh, to invest into the latest anti-aging technology such as like lotions and so on. Then next slide. Then another um, important trend is 
that I would another important trend that I would like to highlight is that the demand for foreign products in the U.S. cosmetic sector. So many U.S. consumers perceive foreign cosmetic as luxury and very high quality. So statistics indicate that foreign product imports and the value of these imports are increasing. Now, now let's move on to regulation and policy. The U.S. cosmetic industry is mainly regulated by the FDA, which is the Food and Drug Administration. And the two most basic requirements are the Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act, um, which forbids the distribution of misbranded products. And the second one is the Fair Packaging and Labeling Act, which requires all products to disclose net contents and name of ingredients. So these are the two most basic ones, which means there are more regulations affecting the cosmetics industry, but I cannot go into detail because of time constraints. Um, next slide, please. So how to enter the U.S. cosmetics market? There are three um, modes of entering the U.S. market. Firstly, by uh, directly exporting a product from overseas into the U.S. Then secondly, by working with an agent, distributor, or manufacturer rep. And then lastly, uh, your last entry mode could be the opening of your own U.S. office or subsidiary. So all of these entry modes have advantages and disadvantages. They take a different amount of time, financial investment, and long-term commitment. So what are the first steps in the beginning of your journey to expand to the U.S.? Next slide. Um, so first of all, understand and evaluate the market. Um, this can be done through a market study, a SWOT analysis. So what are your strengths, weaknesses? What are the opportunities and threats? You can conduct a market test by attending a local trade show, or you can also approach a few potential clients or partners. After you're done with analyzing the market, you will be able to define your position in the market, which is really important. Then also think about your local presence. We do recommend to have a physical address in the US and a phone number to reassure prospects and partners a long-term commitment. Also, it is very important to have a local stock of your products so that you're ready when the first orders come in and you can show that you're reliable to potential partners and customers. Local stock is also usually not enough. So you will need someone to take the orders and of course, receive the money. Um, many large companies here in the US, they actually, they pay in checks, which is, I know it's very different in other countries. Then um, define your sales strategy. What are your prices, transportation costs, and who pays? What happens if your customer is not happy? Do you need insurance to conduct business in the US? And um, lastly, and most importantly, you need the right attitude. Be open, listen, train, invest time and money. You have to be committed because it takes time. So uh, to finalize my presentation, presentation today, I have two examples of companies that we at Reno Consulting worked with in the cosmetic sector in the past. Mm -hmm. The first example is uh, Lear Nature, a French company uh, specialized in organic lotions for body and face. We helped the company by writing a market study and food analysis, as well as a competitor analysis. We also help their nature in prospecting traditional retail chains and online stores. And um, our efforts, they were successful because their nature actually received their first orders, first US orders. And, um, but as it turned out, this first orders required their nature to have products in local stock and the company was not ready to make that move and decided to not pursue the US further. Um, this example highlights the importance of having stock here in the U.S. to make things work in the beginning. Then another example is a, cl a client 
that is called X Skin. This company is from Korea. They're making beauty patches to help with wrinkles and anti-aging. So for this company, we organized uh, B2B meetings in Los Angeles and we introduced them to um, a variety of different distributors. And they also, they started to receive orders and now are starting slowly to um, build their business here in the US. So yes, that's it from my side. Um, thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you very much, Danny, for this first part. Um, maybe a first question. What is the quickest way to start selling in the US? Uh, what is the quickest way to start selling in the US? Um, the quickest way to start selling in the US is most likely by direct export, um, which has advantages and disadvantages. So direct export is fast and has the lowest cost involved, but uh, local stock and support is still needed to be successful. And also Americans have a rather negative perception if you're not locally represented here in the US. So that's because you appear inaccessible if problems occur. So exporting has definitely, it's, it's the fast way to enter, and but it also comes with disadvantages. Okay. If that answers your question. Of course, don't hesitate to uh, any of the participants, uh, if you want to ask any questions, don't hesitate to go on the chat question and chat box to write down your question. I have a second one. How strong mm -hmm. the company has to be to enter the US market? How strong does it have to be? Is this a very small company? Uh, can uh, do you have to be stronger before going to the US? How do you feel that? How, how strong a company should be? Um, I mean, we've worked with uh, many different types of companies, um, small, very small companies, larger companies. Um, it doesn't really depend on like how um, big or how small they are. It's um, it's important that you have a plan in place and that you know the market. So if you have a plan in place, it, it, um, it should work. Okay. Another question, does, does the classic distributor model still exist in the US? Yes, could you please repeat that? Yeah, does the classic distributor model still exist in the US? The classic distributor model? Yeah. Mm, well, um, what do you mean with classic distributor model? That's the question. Like um, here in the US, we have we have different types of distributors that we can work with. We have um, really large um, chains, um, retail chains, like for example, Sephora is one of the biggest ones. Um, and what most of the distributors require is like that you have uh, that you that you have local stock available here in the U.S. So you can I don't know if this is like understand it, like understood as a classic model, but here in the U.S. it's important that you have local stock and that you have local representation and that uh, yeah. That's yeah, important. maybe the, the person who wrote this question might uh, cl clarify it online directly so I can see the what it means exactly. I'll tell you as soon as I have the answer. Because people Perfect. cannot talk Thank directly, you. but they can write it down. So don't hesitate to write down uh, the detail. The detail. What do you mean by classic distribution model? So she can answer you. Maybe another question yeah. uh, waiting for that. Um, you talked about right attitude. Uh, what do you mean by right attitude? Well, right attitude means that um, you have to be uh, patient and you have to be uh, you have to be willing to make investments. You have to um, expect that it might not happen overnight. You know, like it takes time, 
and um, so don't give up if, if it's not happening within the first try you know like it's very important that you're consistent with your efforts you have to if you want to build a uh, business partnership here in the US, you have to follow up with people um, and you have to give it time. So you have to be positive and not give up like if it doesn't work out in the, right in the beginning. You have to be consistent and um, yeah, just positive. Okay. So we have to go to the second part in case we'll be able to send you the Quite detailed question uh, that we yes, didn't please. do. That. Okay. That would be great. In the case of you. able to share, uh, we, we share the contact of all the speakers to all of you. So if you have any question or to go further, don't hesitate. Thank so you. we go to the second part, which is now India. We're crossing uh, the world, <laughs> going to the other side. Uh, so please, Radhika, it's your turn. Right. Uh, so I'm Radhika. I'm uh, the India Director for Expanders Consulting. Um, we have a very short time to talk about a very large country. So what I will do is not really talk about the numbers so much. I will try to tell you the story that these numbers tell. Next slide, please. So my uh, presentation is divided into four parts. I'll talk about the market first then the consumer, then how to enter the market, and then leave it open for questions. Next slide, please. So the market. Like all good stories, the story starts right at the beginning with 8,000 years of history. So the thing about the Indian market is that it is one that is used to the tradition of beauty. We've had uh, the Indus Valley civilization 8,000 years ago, and there are uh, mirrors and beads from that time. So self-beautification is something that India is very, very used to as a culture. We also have Ayurveda, which is a medicine that developed in the country thousands of years ago, using products that are available around plants and herbs and so on. So, uh, for example, even while I was growing up, if you uh, wanted to, um, you know, you have a skin blemish, you want to do some um, do something for it, you go into the kitchen and you put honey or neem or, you know, what is available in your kitchen. So, for a foreign company coming into India today, I would say two things. You have, <clears throat> sorry, you have the advantage of um, coming into a country that is very used to beauty beauty uh, regimes. On the other hand, you have to battle my kitchen because I have my beauty products in my house. Next slide, please. Having said that, there are phenomenal changes that have happened in India over the past 30 years. And I will talk about the two major events that have completely changed the market as I've described it to you so far. The first thing that happened was in 1991, the Indian economy was opened to foreign competition. Until then, it was a closed market with only Indian companies and government-controlled industries. Um, with the uh, liberalization, we've had an explosion of brands, and with that, an explosion of investment in India and a growth in the number of jobs and therefore a growth in spending power of, of the people. On the other hand, in the 2000s, we also had the internet and telecom revolutions that, that took place. So to start with, India had very few telephones but then we skipped the entire uh, landline revolution and went straight to mobile phones. And from mobile phones to mobile phones that are enabled, internet enabled. So today, a lot of Indians are experiencing the internet for the first time on the mobile phone. So these two things have changed India as a market fundamentally. Next slide, please. So, what happened pre-liberalization? Very few brands, and most of them were, all of them had to produce in India to be in India. Today, I have only shown you, sorry, I've only shown you four or five brands there, but we have hundreds of brands, both Indian and foreign, that operate in India today. You have, and sales channels at the same time have increased. Before liberalization, 
you had small departmental stores, you had farm, pharmacies to buy uh, drugs from, and there was some door-to-door -door selling by representatives. Today, you can buy across any number of channels. There are supermarkets, there are multi-brand outlets, single brand outlets, boutiques, standalone stores, and even online retail. Next slide, please. In the 90s, once liberalization had happened, there has been a massive investment by media and by um, uh, beauty brands to educate the Indian customer about the, uh, the Im importance of using scientifically developed products. So you would have um, in the 90s to 2000s, you had a lot of Indian women winning beauty patents. It wasn't as though suddenly Indian women became beautiful. It was basically an investment made by beauty brands. And you see that today with, uh, of course, I have the most famous of them all, Aishwarya Rai on the screen there. She continues to be today, you know, 30, uh, 25 odd years later, she continues to be um, the uh, brand ambassador for L'Oreal. And on the other side of the screen, you see an Indian brand, Lakme, that uh, took on events and organized fashion, uh, the fashion Week, India Fashion Week every year. So a lot of investment has gone into promoting beauty. Next slide, please. So um, I won't really spend too much time on this slide because you can read it when you get the presentation. I just want to say that there is uh, exponential growth happening in the market today. It stands at about 6 billion and in about five years, it's going to become 18 billion. So it's growing at an average rate of uh, 16 to 25 year on year. Next slide, please. And what are these growth factors? As I said, there is a rise in purchasing power because of uh, more jobs, job creation in the country. There's also a higher number of women who are taking up jobs in the workplace and therefore with higher disposable incomes. An adoption of Western beauty standards that I talked about. And also a very young connected population that is able to receive brand messaging from across the world. And uh, along with it, a boom in e-retail. Next slide, please. So if you look at category-wise how Indians spend on, um, on beauty products, you will, uh, you will see that we spend the most, half of what we spend today is on hair products. We're obsessed with hair products. Hair oils, hair dyes, shampoos, um, you know, um, anti-hair fall um, products and uh, anything that you can put on the market, India will consume. However, the others are um, a little less developed, like fragrance and cosmetics. Um, fragrance is dominated by deodorants. We don't really have a massive fragrance market yet. Um, and uh, it's the same to do with cosmetic colors. Um, but these are opportunity spaces that you can get into because the cr it's less crowded as far as brand presence is concerned. Next slide, please. So the market trends, there are many, but I want to just pick on three, which I will show you on the next three uh, slides. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah. So there are three major trends, and one is a shift towards natural brands. And this is something that pretty much um, reflects what the rest of the world is going through. There is, um, there is a uh, conscious effort uh, to turn away from uh, parabens and other toxins and to go towards natural brands. And this cuts across all market segments. You have uh, mass market brands like Patanjali and you have high-end brands like Kama Ayurveda and everything in between. Next slide, please. And you also have a proliferation of independent brands and celebrity run brands. So you have on the on the one end, you have the L'Oreal and, uh, you know, you have Bobby Brown, you have um, a body shop, which have done really well. But you have a lot of independent brands that are launched all across India. There are literally hundreds and hundreds. Sometimes there is a brand that only is available only in one city because the person who's making it is in only that city. But with the growth of um, Instagram culture, they are doing quite well. Next slide, please. Radhika, just to tell you that there are two minutes left. Yes, next slide, please. Um, and I, 
just, I just talked about the Instagram uh, culture, which is uh, bringing up a lot more Instagram influences. Next slide, please. So who is this Indian consumer today? Next slide, please. So I want to give you a quick picture of why India is such an important consumer market today. It is the seventh largest by size, the second largest by population, and it is soon going to overtake China and become the largest country in 2024. Not only are we a large population, we're also a very young population. 35, 65% uh, of the country is under the age of 35. And it's a highly connected population with 50% uh, of the population living in cities by the year 2030. Next slide, please. And what is really interesting about this is that the middle classes, which are the middle two segments um, that you can see on the chart in front of you, the upper middle and the lower middle, are growing in number in, uh, in a, a proportion to the rest, which means that today, Indian middle class, which is the main consuming class, is 50% of the country. In 10 years, we're going to be 70% of the country. Next slide, please. And this makes us the third largest consumer market in the years to come. In terms of gender-wise spending, um, today India, uh, in India, the middle class, 60% of uh, the spending in cosmetics comes from women and 40 from men. I will leave you to read the rest of uh, the numbers when you get the slide. Next slide, please. So in, um, there are many trends. Um, I have spoken about a lot of them, about, <clears throat> about hair and skin care, but there's one that I want to pick up and that is about the men's grooming market. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? The men's grooming market is growing at 45% year on year. Um, in the 2000s, like they did for uh, in the 90s for Indian women, in the 2000s, there was this focus on the metrosexual man. You have, you know, basically your David Beckham, in um, in the world stage and in India, there were a lot of Bollywood stars that styled themselves well and began to make it acceptable for Indian men to spend time and money on self-care. Next slide, please. With the result that in the last year, from April 2018 to March 2019, there were 177 male grooming brands that were launched. That's two per week in India. And we've listed a few of them, Bombay Shaving Company, Let Shave Beardo. These are all very small independent brands, but all managing to capture some amount of this incredibly uh, explosive market. Next, please. So how do you enter this market? There are two, three uh, different ways. Of course, the first and the easiest is to, uh, is to find an importer and a distributor. Um, you should find an importer that will do all your registrations for you because there are a certain number of registrations, product res registrations that you need to do, which I will, um, which are stated on the uh, next slide. Um, you should find a distributor, but please remember that uh, distribution in India is very fragmented. It is a large country. It's the size of at least four or five European countries put together, which makes it impossible for any one distributor to really be able to service the entire market. So um, my suggestion is usually to find at least four distributors uh, or three distributors who specialize in their region, not Southeast West. If you plan to enter the mass market, you might want to look at a manufacturing partner, in which case you might need to start your subsidiary and start a joint venture. Both are easy to do. Um, companies with 100% foreign capital are allowed in India and joint ventures are uh, one of the ways in which you can enter into manufacturing partnerships. But whichever you choose, you should look at marketing as a separate activity. Most importers and distributors do not have the capacity to market. And since this is a B2C product, cosmetics um, are a B2C product, you do have to find um, a separate marketing team to ensure that your product does well on the market. Next slide, please. Um, so the main um, organization that you have to uh, register your products with is CDSCO, Central Drug Standard Control Organization. And um, animal testing is banned in India, so you do have to have a non-animal tested um, certification. And you do need to remember that there are customs duties that still operate in India. Even though we are a liberalized country, we're not a 100% liberalized country, there are customs duties. And usually this is to promote manufacturing in India. Next slide, please. 
And by that, I mean that uh, the Indian government tries to uh, create uh, special economic zones in which there are uh, less um, or no customs and excise duties to develop manufacturing um, uh, segments in India. So in Uttaranchal, which is in the north of India, you find a cluster, a cosmetics cluster of a lot of small industries that have set up because of these SOPs given by the government. You also find in the south of India, around Chennai, um, a hub for essential oils and fragrances. So uh, if you are looking to manufacture or source, there are also these avenues in India. Next slide, please. You also need to remember that market adaptation is important. I will only talk about one. There are lots of aspects, but I only talk about one, which is um, that you have to think about packaging in a different way. One of the ways in which um, L'Oreal managed to enter the market was to create single-use sachets that are about three inches long, maybe one inch wide, that allowed the ordinary Indian to be able to try the product and therefore to be able to buy it more regularly. These costed just one rupee when they started, which is about two cents, three cents. And um, today L'Oreal is everywhere, but you will find a much smaller packet size, right? I will um, leave it open to questions now. I think um, we're, we're running out of time. Um, but I'm happy to come back to any of these um, these factors if I've gone over it too quickly. Thank you very much, Radhika. <clears throat> um, what would you say are the two things that illustrate um, how the Indian cosmetic market is evolving? Maybe right. you have yeah. Um, actually, I do have a couple of slides. If you can go to the next one, maybe. Yes, we can. Yes, thank you. So I would say that um, India is so complex that everything I say about India is true and the very opposite of it is also true. So on the one hand, um, we talk about an explosion of, um, of retail, but uh, e-retail today remains 6% of the on the complete uh, the full retail market yet in this in this 6% there is this one website called nika e retail that has managed to completely change how people look at uh, cosmetics what, the biggest problem that i talked about uh, earlier was of um, delivery and what um, a brick and mortar stores have a difficulty in doing is to have a lot of a um, lot of shops. So e-retail has really managed to take off because <clears throat> co cosmetics brands tend to have small margins in India. And if you add on the cost of putting up a store, it becomes too much. So what Nika did is to create a platform for all sorts of brands to sell online. So they started in 2012, they became an omni-channel e-retailer. Today they have brick and mortar and uh, online and offline presence because especially for cosmetics you need to try you want to see how the color looks on you you want to smell the perfume and you want to be sure that's that's what you want right and then what happened with covid it actually illustrates how behavior is changing in india you had a dip in sales and then in april we uh, india shut down in march in april nika is one of the few companies that had a v-shaped recovery so they they went down like everybody else and they shot right back up um, because in the pandemic, people could only buy online. And people who were not buying online before are now also buying online. So there's a conversion of millions of people who were not e-shoppers e into e-shoppers. So this is one of this um, e-retail is, is a, a growth story. It's also because distribution is going to be tech-backed. And whenever you have tech, there is going to be an organizing factor in the market. So this is a story to watch out for. And the other I would talk about, uh, do we have other questions or do you want me to go? Uh... Yes, we have. Um, what do we need to register? So, yeah, what do we need to register to be online? So you do need to be registered in the country with CDSCO. So your product needs to be registered uh, first with uh, the government authorities. Once that is done, you just have to reference yourself with Nika, so, which is one, one channel. You can also reference yourself with Amazon, with uh, Flipkart, and with a, a lot of other retailers as well. Yeah, um, another question, the biggest online platform. 
Yes, so you basically need to have uh, look at them as a distributor and you would have your same dis uh, discussions that you would have with your distributor. What would be your uh, margin percentage? Who would be the one doing your logistics? Who will be doing your warehousing? So you need to ensure that from the time that it is imported into the country till the time it reaches their wa warehouses that they take care of it. And then um, and, and therefore that percentage of margin is what they would uh, they would take. Okay. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting uh, second part also. We also short for questions, but uh, don't hesitate to get in contact afterwards. So we'll go on the third part. Let's go to Emirates, United Arab Emirates, Emirates sorry, uh, with Jean-Pierre Lavoie. Thank you, Radhika. Thank you, Jean-Pierre, Jean put on your camera, please. Yes. <laughs> uh, Okay. Great. So great. Thanks. Yep. So let's travel to uh, Middle East. Yep. Yes. And uh, UAE. Uh, of course, we see Burj Khalifa, the tallest uh, building in the world, more than 800 meters. So let's go to slide now. Next slide. Uh, TTA Golf, as I told you, it's a consulting comp company and we have also an office in Europe, in France, and uh, we are helping in France companies, uh, especially for their stri strategy definition. Uh, so we we have these two companies. Yeah. We are not only acting in the cosmetic sector, of course, we go in different uh, other sectors, industrial, transport, te textile, F&B, healthcare. So uh, cosmetic is one of them. And uh, the next slide, please, for all these sectors, we go, as I told you, for sales and marketing, distribution supply chains, we make company setup, financial services, HR management, legal, and also intercultural and leadership training. I will come back to it afterwards. Yeah, so let's speak about uh, Middle East first, at least for you to have an overview of the regions, yeah? Because when we speak about Dubai, and when we speak about Middle East, we, uh, you know, the UAE said that they are in the middle of uh, everywhere and that uh, from the Dubai airport, they can uh, reach uh, more than 3 billion uh, people. And in fact, it's true because when you looked at uh, the Dubai airport, it's the third largest airport in the world. Uh, so we have a lot of transit also, and uh, we have approximately 100 million uh, passengers per year. So uh, from Dubai, you, it's usually known as a regional hub where you could cover North of Africa with Egypt, sometimes Turkey, sometimes also India, and definitely uh, Levant and the GCC countries. So when you look at um, UAE, it's 10 million people. When you look at the Gulf countries, so Qatar, Saudi, Bahrain, Oman, Kuwait, you come to 55 million people. And then if you had Egypt, Iraq, Jordan, and Lebanon, you end up with more than 200 million people. So that makes quite an interesting market. Next slide. Uh, when you looked at the uh, Middle East, um, almost 50% of the people are foreigners. And if we go to the next slide, you see that in terms of uh, population, almost 90% of the population in UAE are foreigners. And this is what makes it quite challenging because we speak a lot about diversity. We speak about inclusion, how to include uh, different people. Uh, and local people is just out of these 10 million, it's just 1 million people. If you speak, for example, Qatar with uh, 2.5 million uh, people, it's 350,000 Qatari people only. So you have to, you, you have to see that when you address UAE, it's quite a challenging market because you will have consumer coming from India, from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Philippines, from Egypt, from Nepal, from Sri Lanka, from China, of course, locally, Europe. So uh, you need to address a large uh, community. Next one. Uh, of course, when you come to Dubai, and if you work in Dubai, that's to get more money. So basically, the people have quite a lot of money to spend. And you will see when we look at the cosmetic figure after, that if you compare with India, for example, we reach quite interesting value as well. Uh, next one. 
So let's speak a li little bit about uh, this COVID-19 uh, issue that we are all facing. Um, UAE has definitely taken a very strict uh, measure. Uh, from February, they, uh, they say that uh, school will start only in September. They closed Dubai Airport for a while and they made almost 6 million tests out of 10 million people. So most of the people were tested and then uh, isolated in case they had uh, an issue in an hotel, for example, with a strict uh, uh, 14 days uh, period. So you, you, when you looked at it, you see that, of course, you have uh, um, a, quite a, a large number of uh, people who have been uh, positive. But when you go back to the death, you see that this figure is very uh, limited. In fact, so next one. Uh, if you look at uh, UAE, uh, as I told you, um, uh, the airport now is fully open and uh, operational. I think uh, compared to Europe, Asia started quicker. If you looked at China, for example, the market restarted also uh, quicker. Uh, if you look at the Middle East, <coughs> this is exactly the same thing. And this is quite an interesting point because sometimes companies are thinking, yeah, should I develop internationally? Should I export? And uh, you need to see that uh, the French the French company, for example, in the French market that are exporting are doing much better than those who are just on the national market. So export is definitely not a question, should I go, should I not go? But rather, yes, I should diversify, increase my number of, uh, of uh, clients. And of course, the challenge today that we have is how to export uh, with distance because of course it's difficult to travel these days so let's go back to the next uh, slide so when we speak about the cosmetic market uh, uh, sorry in terms of population yeah as i told you 10 million people and we have different uh, seven emirates in fact in the, in the in the country yeah next one um Men and women, approximately two thirds of uh, of men compared to uh, to uh, to women. Uh, this is explained also by the fact that we have a lot of uh, people coming from Asia uh, who are workers and they come alone. They don't come with the family. Uh, but when you look at the age of the population, you see that uh, a very high percentage of the population is young, and of course, these young people will also spend a lot of money because you see that the largest. Uh, uh, scale is 25 to 54 years old. Yeah. Uh, so let's speak about cosmetics. Yeah. Next slide. So if we looked at the UAE market, we speak about 2.2 billion dollar, and just before we had a presentation about India, it was around 6 billion. So imagine for a very small country, you have very high. Uh, con consumption of uh, cosmetic, in fact. Uh, people have a lot of money, they are uh, spending a lot. Yeah, when you see uh, the expenses, annual expenses per habitant, you see that uh, we are on the ninth place in the world, 220 euro uh, for people as an average. And of course, uh, people are really taking care of themselves, not only uh, women, but also men. So let's go back to the next uh, slide. You see that the growth is also very interesting almost 3% per year. So of course, uh, the market is dominated by multinational. Uh, this, is, uh, this is sure, but not only. And uh, you see that the dominant categories is perfume, 30%, but you have also makeup, skincare, hair product, also which are there. And what is quite interesting is about the trends and the developments. The consumer are getting more educated, obviously, especially with internet, and they really want to have innovative product. They want also uh, halal product. We can uh, discuss about it if you want. Organic product as well, because uh, people are really looking also at uh, living with better conditions. So uh, all that uh, makes quite interesting this market, especially for the new brands which are coming. Uh, so you don't have to be really uh, large. You can be also quite small. We address clients. They are very sm small size companies and they still do well uh, in the Middle East market. What's interesting also is the influence of social network. Uh, UAE is uh, one of the country, uh, number one country in the world with uh, fiber penetration. More than 99% of the country is covered with fiber. So there is a good development of online sales compared to stores, specifically because of COVID as well. A lot of people have started uh, buying uh, online 
And obviously, this is uh, one of the, the topic that uh, is very uh, interesting. Next one. Jean-Pierre, just to tell you that there are two minutes left. Okay, <laughs> the next one. So uh, you will have this presentation anyway, uh, giving you a little bit more detail about the online re retailing, but this is one also of the distribution channel that you have to consider. Yeah, please. Uh, discussing about uh, local, but also international companies. Yes, next slide. Uh, social media and e-commerce, we discussed about it. What's good is that the sales growth is still uh, positive. And here, of course, to access the market, you need to find, uh, yeah, this is okay, you can go to the next one. You need to register your product. You need to find a company that would register your product before distributing. Uh, for that, I give you uh, some uh, fees for the, for example, Dubai municipality and uh, ESMA as well. And, um, and then, uh, see the different categories in uh, baby product, makeup, uh, hair, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, next slide. Uh, what's quite interesting also to see is that because we have a lot of tourists, tourists come in the market and they don't come just to uh, enjoy the desert, but they come also to enjoy shopping. So we have a lot of shopping malls. So tourism is also uh, very important, especially duty-free, but not only. And then we have a lot of uh, shopping malls. Yeah, next slide. Uh, you can see Shaloub, it's a very important uh, group, uh, regional group. Uh, they went into innovations with a test bar, for example. Uh, so I give you this example with a magic mirror. Yeah, next next one. And then you see different types of, sh of, uh, of uh, shops that we can have. Sephora, for example, Gucci. Uh, people spend a lot on cosmetic. And you can see the large number of malls uh, that are available uh, in the country. Yeah, next one. Uh, Beauty World is uh, the most famous uh, trade exhibition. It was supposed to be in October. It has been postponed to 23rd to 25th November. And uh, Cosmetic Valley is also part of this, uh, um, uh, of this exhibition. It's a very, very large one. Yeah, next. Now, when you come to, uh, to Dubai, how how to manage, uh, what to do. So I give you uh, four different ideas on uh, how to uh, to export and to expand. Yeah, next slide. Uh, because of COVID, of course, we have to look with distance. Yeah, so I give you four solutions. The first one, if you can go, uh, yes, uh, is a test on offer. The second one uh, is participate with the, uh, in the collective missions. The third one is commercial development. And the last one, is uh, have somebody, <coughs> sorry, locally. Yeah, can you go to the next slide? So test on offer, what does it mean? It's just giving us the possibility as the consulting company to tell you in three months time, if yes or no, your product can be okay in the market, checking with competition, discussing with client distributors, uh, some retailers and see what are the possibilities if price-wise you're okay or not. So this is, I would say, in distance, a quite easy things to do. The other one is the commercial development. You, you know that there is a possibility for you. You want to accelerate your growth and we have a, a, lo a local team available. We have seven uh, people, uh, uh, sorry, seven languages. We speak seven languages and then we can definitely help you on the commercial side uh, with your distributor and to put some dynamic within the network. The other two uh, that are left, it's participate in a collective mission. So what you need to think about is, I'm a small company, maybe I don't have enough funds, but I could find another two or three other companies not competing with you who could join effort and then see how you could in, uh, in one session make some B2B meetings uh, mutualize on the logistics supports, uh, trying to see how you can find uh, uh, distributors. So that's really something which is really uh, going on today. And you can combine these collective missions that you will do with the, for example, uh, Beauty World. And uh, you can take the advantage of going to the exhibitions and then have to, some B2B meeting uh, arranged. And then assisting an employee locally, because sometimes we have people who say, yeah, I would like to put somebody in place. Uh, we have an incubator in our office and basically we are going to rent uh, some space for your employee for six months, uh, 12 months, and then to validate the market. 
you could recruit somebody uh, locally, or we have also payroll solution and incubation, I spoke about it. So I give a few examples here of uh, some missions. Maybe we'll just uh, speak about the first one, uh, the next slide, uh, which is business setup. This was done for a fragrance uh, a cosmetic uh, company, and we made uh, uh, an office there so that uh, they, they can have local presence. So for me, if I uh, want to, to speak about Middle East, I think Dubai is really a nice hub to be. You can really reach a lot of uh, consumers from Dubai, and it's very important to, uh, to export uh, in these countries. You need to think digital, you need to think uh, innovations, and this will help you to di diversify and get more, more, more clients uh, in your uh, turnover. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for this presentation. Quick, huh? Yes. <laughs> yeah, we, sorry. Well, sorry, Jean-Pierre, but that was fine. <laughs> so this will be a real quick question. Uh, it was uh, someone, uh, how can we get a halal certification? Yeah, so so basically the halal certification is just to make sure that it, it, your, your product uh, don't have or don't contain things like pork, for example, so you need to go through the specs of your product and then you, you need to go through the registrations as well just to show that in terms of cosmetic there is nothing inside in terms of animals or some substance that uh, that could be uh, not, not approved. So that's basically uh, quite easy, I would say, to, uh, to do. It's just an administrative part. Okay. And another one. Which are the main e-retailers in uh, Emirates? Yeah, so of course we have, uh, we don't have Amazon as such. I mean, we, sorry, we had souk.com. Now it's called uh, Amazon.ae uh, that you can find is definitely the largest one. Uh, souk.com was bought by, uh, by Amazon uh, two years ago. And then we've got some different other uh, re 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 resellers. Of course, one big one is Majid Al Futem with Carrefour, uh, who has done a lot of online uh, as well. And then we've got some specific ones uh especially shops uh, that have also comes with uh, digital solutions but there are quite a few i would say same like india it's it's really on the early stage so you need to consolidate on that and uh, definitely there there are room for uh, for companies to uh, to not only think about uh, classic uh, distributions but also go into the uh, uh, digital business perfect thank you very much so before closing up this uh, webinar, which was which was full of information, uh, just let me inform you of a quick uh, next events of the Cosmetic Valley, most of them. Um, of course, eCosmetic 360, which it, it's from Cosmetic Valley, but of course open to everyone in the world, dedicated to innovation in the fragrance and cosmetic industry, which are is going to be held in October 12th and 13th. Just for info, your information, in France, we will have a national conference for the fragrance and cosmetic industry following up the COVID period in order to boost, um, to boost uh, the industry and to help the companies the best way we will be able to. Uh, in the following days and or month, we'll also have the uh, Congress dedicated to regulation, which is held uh, every year, and it will be on November 4th and 5th. It, it's also in English for more, uh, English speakers. And one of the partners uh, of the Global Cosmic Cluster Europe project, which is Beauty Cluster Barcelona, is organizing an event um, cosmetic formulation e forum dedicated to innovation in your cosmetics. So you can also have the information. It will be on September 30th. Um, well, it's coming to the end. Uh, for sure, you'll be a bit sad not to have as much as information you were waiting for, but uh, we, we took this decision to have this first step, this first introduction to three countries. There are huge countries or huge region. So it was hard for the speakers, hard for us to keep up the, the timing. But once again, it's just a first step. And it's a first step in this European project we're holding. 
dedicated to SMEs, dedicated to internationalization of the SMEs. And once again, SMEs are not only brands, so maybe we'll be able to focus more on packaging or raw material or something on second steps. Um, so this Global Cosmic Cluster Europe is a project dedicated to you as SMEs. So don't hesitate to get in contact with your cluster, or well, it's positive name cluster, it's association. <laughs> And in this time, it's quite hard to use that uh, word, but anyway, uh, so this project is starting from now. So be welcome to contact us to let us know what you are looking for, what are you, uh, what do you need, so we can uh, modulate, uh, make evaluate this project in order to be the most relevant for you, in order to bring you uh, to get to those uh, target countries. Thank you very, very much, Radhika, Sandy, and Jean-Pierre for these presentations. Um, it was a hard job for you. Uh, <laughs> and once again, the presentation are able to any of the participants to upload, to download them. So don't hesitate. And we're here to discuss and exchange experience all together. So don't hesitate. Thank you very, very much and talk to you very soon. Bye. Thank you so much for Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.